Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering a CIRA. Mark and Margaret Yankel Julien, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm, shalomhill.org. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living, providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Growing up on the farm, we always had chickens. In the spring of the year, my parents would stop at the post office and pick up the baby chicks that had arrived. Then pick me up at school and we would listen to cheep, cheep, cheep all the way home. My mom loved her chickens, which roamed our entire yard eating crickets, grasshoppers and other pests that would have threatened our garden. Whether on a farm or even in town, let's go learn about this growing trend of raising chickens. appreciate when people contact me or give me ideas for Prairie Yard and Garden shows. Several years ago, a lady emailed to suggest we do a show on backyard chickens. Then last fall, when I spoke at a conference in South Dakota, four more people suggested we do a show on chickens. I pleaded my case with Mike, our show producer, and he finally said, yes, we could do it if I could find a guest to do the show. <laughs> well, I already had. I uh, attended a garden day last spring and Dr. Florian Letterman gave such a great seminar that I learned a lot and hope you will too. Thanks Florian for letting us come to visit. Well, it's good that you could come. How did you get started growing chickens and why? Oh, it's kind of a lifelong thing for me. I had um, grew up with chickens on the farm like, like he did and through the years and my my uh, profession as a veterinarian, of course, I got to see some chickens, not, not necessarily healthy ones, but we got to see some chickens. And um, we had chickens, I remember when our first son was born, we had a baby chick <laughs> for Easter and grew it up in our yard. Um, so we've been doing it all the time. And then when we got the vineyard, I thought, oh, this is a great place to have some chickens. So you have a vineyard and then you incorporated the chickens kind of into your vineyard? Yes, we did, because they have multiple functions that they can perform for us there. Now, what are some of the things that people should consider before they go out to buy chickens or decide they want to grow some? Well, first you have to have the right place for them. So if you have neighbors, you got to be considerate of your neighbors, because especially if you have roosters, they may not be the best alarm clocks for everybody. And also consider, you know, the area as far as predators that might be common in the area, how close you are to, you know, those kind of dangers and how much room you have. What do you want the birds to do? Do you want them for meat or for eggs or for fun? Those are all things to think about. Are there different breeds of chickens and how do you decide which ones that you want to order? Uh, in winter when it's boring, like in January, I get out the chicken catalog. And I can remember my dad had a book called The Standards of Perfection. It was about all of the chickens in the world. And I used to sit and read that as a kid. I always thought it was fascinating. So now when I look at a chicken catalog and pick up breeds, and I kind of vary them up every year so we have a little different, make it interesting. Where do you order your chickens from or where can people get them? We got ours from McMurray Hatchery in Iowa. 
and they come by parcel post to the post office. <laughs> And we usually get about 25. And then do you get some for meat or for eggs or how do you decide which ones you want to get each year? Some of each. And the egg layers will get the brown egg layers, the Araucanas with the blue and colored eggs and white eggs and so it's kind of like a lot of variety in this place here. How old are the chicks when they come? Day old. One day old. Okay. And then, um, do you have to do anything special with them right away when they come in? I don't know. We were always taught as kids that when the first thing you do is give them a drink of water when they take them out of the box, and then under a heat lamp so they don't get chilled. And have we used to put our uh, little crumbles feed, you know, complete feed in a in an open egg carton, so it was easy for them to get to, so so that they learn right away where the water is, where the food is, and then all you have to do is then is have them in the heat like with a heat lamp or a brooder. We usually just use a heat lamp or two heat lamps. And they'll decide where the right temperature is. You know, we have an enclosure around them like a, uh, a border so that they can't jump out using like uh, the cedar. We use the cedar shavings that you can get in most farm stores. It works good and it smells good. So. Well, we used straw, but we didn't use it until a little later on just mm -hmm. because we were afraid of the um, of the heat lamps starting them on oh, yeah. on fire and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, but that's a great idea to use the wood shavings. And why is it important to keep them warm? Well, their their body temperature, like ours, they don't function when they start to get too cold. They actually go into shock. So, and if they're too warm, of course, you have cooked chicken, so you don't want that. So, there's they'll tell you if you give them a chance so that they can get away from the heat or come closer. If they start piling, you know they're too cold, and if they you know, are too far away from the heat lamp, you're wasting heat, and you do have a more danger of fire if you get too close to your combustible material, like anything like straw or shavings. Where do you keep them when they first come in? We have a little chicken coop here, and we put it in a garage, and it's in usually in late March or early April, so it's pretty cold outside. And we use that same hut that we pull out into the vineyard later. So that's where they're in. So after they're grown enough, like two, three weeks, and we'll take the enclosure away that's around them, which is about four foot round or diameter, and let them have the, the run of the, like the six by eight, you know, pen that they're, or the, the uh, coop that we have. Would it be possible to see your chicken coop? Oh, I think that's why you're here, right? You bet. <laughs> okay. And Mary, this is the coop actually that we built for this vineyard. And you notice it's just wide enough to fit into the, between the rows. And it's light enough so that one person can pull it. Well, maybe not me anymore, I'm a grandpa, but my granddaughter can do it. Um, so we built it out of just two by fours that were laying around and some leftover tin. And A-frame in design so that when the wind blows, it's like the teepees of the Indians had in the prairie. You know, they don't, they don't blow over very easy because of the wind design. The wind will go over rather than buffeting the wind. And on the back we have the nest, you can see, and in the nest this morning, there are two nice eggs. <laughs> <laughs> they just started laying uh, now and they're four months old. Some of the more the purebred chickens are a little later a lot of times, but these are from the, this is actually an Aracana egg, which is, you know, a lot of olive green, which um, we always say the earlobe kind of tells you the color of the egg's going to be. So if you have a white earlobe, you have white eggs, you have a brown ear. But the, the Araucanas kind of throw that into a little bit of a, it doesn't quite fit because these are not the same color as their earlobe. But that's how you can tell. So when you get your chicks in, you have this in the garage. Mm -hmm. And then now I notice that you have a feeder that's in here mm -hmm. for the chickens. And you have that up off the ground. Is there a reason for that? Well, number one, so they can reach it easier, of course, but that's not a, not the main reason. The, just so we can move the the house and the, the feeder goes with. And, okay. Yeah, and we move it about every two days or so. Um, we don't have to sanitize anything because we keep moving around. And these chickens, of course, develop a strong immunity to everything, you know, being outdoors and having a lot of exposure to the elements. The number one problem in chicks a lot of times is coccidiosis. So we always keep a coccidiostat in, which is completely safe, you know, for it doesn't get into the chicken's meat or anything. So.
Do you run into much problem with diseases or insect problems with raising chickens? No, it's kind of the other way around. The chickens prevent insect problems for the grapes. Uh, some of the bugs that live in, in and around. So they, like fruit flies for instance, I've seen them actually catching fruit flies um, you know, out of the midair. Unfortunately, they also, chickens like to eat grapes. So we've, we did a little calculation as to how many grapes could they eat before we had to kill the chickens. And we figured they only ate about two or 300 pounds during the season. And we'll get like 10 to 20,000 pounds of grapes. So you say, oh, okay, chickens can have a few grapes. And, but you know, the, when the grapes are purple, you don't want to have those eggs be turning purple. But that's a joke though. Okay, okay, got you now. <laughs> but it's, it's um, they really have a nice function in the vineyard. When you order your chickens, you get a mixture. And I can tell you get some roosters too. Mm -hmm. Why do you get both? roosters and hens? The roosters got several purposes besides breeding the hens. They, they're also the watch, the watch bird or the watchdog. And so when a hawk comes flying over or a big bird of any kind, you'll hear him just yet, let, out, let out a yell and all of the hens and stuff will scatter and they'll get underneath the, the grapes and stuff. It's really something to watch. And that, when you drove up, you probably heard them crowing. So they're announcing that there's someone here. Um, they have that function, and they also will actually attack some of them. We had the leghorn that you see here is not doing it yet, but last year and the year before, we had uh, one that could actually get pretty aggressive. And so, especially with women, for some reason. But he would come up behind you. They're real cowards, but they, they all, they'll come out with their feet and their breastbone and their wings and hit you from behind. And, do they ever do it to you since they know you so well? Only once. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, when you uh, come out to, to, uh, to the chickens, do they know you? And uh, do they come running to meet you? Or are they kind of scared? Because you get people visiting here at the vineyard. Do you notice a difference yeah. in how they treat you as compared to treating uh, yeah, us visitors? They, they get to be real friends, you know. And they all, if they're a long ways away, they'll actually fly towards you. It's kind of... You know, it's kind of a good feeling that somebody loves you. <laughs> it, it's kind of, um, the personality of chickens is something I didn't know a lot about until we actually had them here for a longer period of time. But I had one that, um, I was sitting waiting for some people to come to the winery under the per pergola there. And I had that little Bose speaker there with Charlie Pride singing. And this chicken came up and sat down on the table and I was looking at the speaker all the time. Like, where is this coming from? That doesn't sound like you. And pretty soon it started singing with Charlie Pride. And I've got actually a, a video of that. <laughs> so they have really unique personalities. That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> it sounds like um, the different chickens have personalities. Do you notice that more with the different breeds or is it the individuals? Different breeds, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, some, some of them, like we had a rooster last year that didn't want to associate with the other, so he was always out on the outlying areas. And then one day I found just his feathers and a couple toes. Um, so a hawk had gotten him. So straying from the group can get you in trouble in the chicken world. So that's the reason why, you know, that how they develop their own social network. So hawks are one of the predators you have to worry about here. Are there others? Oh yes, everything likes chicken. And that can be raccoons, skunks, fox, coyotes, hawks, um, neighborhood dogs. That can be a problem. Not so much with cats, but when they're, when they're bigger. We don't lock our door at night here because we have electric fence around the outside to keep the coyotes and the bigger animals out. And that seems to work. If we move this hut, they always know where it is. Do they actually eat insects? Or you had mentioned at one time in your class that they also eat clover. So if a person has clover, that would be great for them to clean that out of your yard too. Well, interesting, this is bluegrass that we planted in here, but then the, the white clover came in uh, shortly after. And so like in June, it's almost all white in here and they pick the heads off of that and they really like that. And then when the roses we have on the end of the rows, they like to eat the roses. They like anything that's bright and colorful. So when the grapes turn purple, I think they're more attracted to the grapes. But 
they're practicing already, you know, catching the, the green ones. So. Well, I noticed you have your grapes trimmed up higher. Is that so that the chickens can't reach quite as easily? Well, primarily it's because to keep um, the, the grapes healthy. Okay. Yeah, because of fungus and stuff, you need air movement underneath. It provides great cover for the chickens, like with, with you know, the flying birds, because they can get under, and birds don't like to come into a tight area. They like to be able to scoot in and scoot out with the prey. So there's some advantages of backyard chickens in a vineyard versus in a backyard. When we were raising our chickens, we had um, a section where the chickens could roost. Can you explain that and why they like that? Well, it's, it's their, their natural behavior is to be up or high, up higher, and I think it's because of predators and stuff in their development, domestication. So we have a couple of rails in the back of this that they'll, they'll jump up there, and for the most part, they like to be up high. What is the difference between free range and caged, and what are some of the advantages of each? The advantages of the caged birds, which is what 90-some 90, 90 percent of our eggs in the supermarket come from, um, would be that they can control the environment. So they can control disease, they can control, you know, predators and temperature and all this stuff. So, so the chickens, um, very high livability, uh, very little loss, and lots of eggs. You know, they'll lay an egg average, average one every day. And whereas if you go to the free range or cage free. Cage free is a step in between where they'll have a building but there's no cages so the chickens are roaming around inside a building. And then this one where they have range everywhere obviously in the winter time it wouldn't work and so we in the fall when it starts to get into November uh, actually we just give them away and there's always people that want a few laying hens that have indoor hut that they can do it in. So the, the plus for being outside like this is that uh, it's, it's, I don't know, the aesthetic of it is great, you know, and all that type of thing, but there is a higher death loss and there is more chance that the chickens are going to run into adverse conditions. Do you find that when the chickens are outside roaming like this that your egg yolks are darker? Yes, and that has to do with the, as I understand it, it's the chlorophyll that's in the grass and green that makes them. A lot of people think they taste better. I do could all be in our heads, but that's all that matters, right? Can you tell us about what are the breeds that you like to have and what are some of the characteristics of each of them? We're kind of looking for a wide variety and, and that's kind of my lifestyle. I guess okay. I like a lot of variety in life. Um, like in my work as a veterinarian, I like to take care of all kinds of animals and birds. So it just depends on what you like. But if you're looking for for instance, for a field chicken or a free-range chicken, you want to get a breed that's adapted to that. And so uh, right now we have what's called the range broilers, which the roosters we've already butchered, but the larger brown hens here are range birds. So in other words, they've been developed to be a free-range. And then the red star, which is another one of my favorite, is really a good layer that, that grazes well and does well in that environment. The two uh, uh, notable rooster breeds that we have here are the brown leghorn, Mediterranean, so it's called Mediterranean brown leghorn, and the other one is a phoenix. So they are very notable in their color. And the Mediterranean leghorn, there's, there's two types. There's one with a, with a rose comb like we have, and then there's one with a straight comb. I also saw a chicken walking around that had feathers on its legs. Yeah, those are uh, cochins. Those are buff cochins. Okay. Yeah, with the feathered legs. The white broiler that's common for, for people eating them when they're young, this is not the place for them because they would not handle the, the adverse conditions at all. They're bred genetically to grow fast in a close environment. So when you're studying what you want, most of the hatcheries and stuff, you'll, they'll describe the type of chicken that you might want. And like I say, we have a wide variety. and. When people come here to the winery, we, we like them to see different kinds, you know. The food that you give them now is adults. You give them, in, you give them a supplement in addition to the grass and the insects and everything. Is this a different type of a food that you use now as compared to when they were little? No, we use a standard commercial laying mix. And it's a, we use a pellet because they don't waste as much. 
uh, if it's a mash or a granule and they pick at it, sometimes some goes flying. And, and once it's in the ground, it's hard for them. We have sometimes used scratch feed, which is a mixture of corn and oats and that type of thing that you can throw on the ground if you really like chickens. And do that every day or a couple times a day and watch them all come up. But it seems like we've got other things that are maybe more important to do here, so we don't have time for that. <laughs> okay. Do your chickens like to be around you when you're out working in the vineyard? They love people. Most of them, yeah, they'll come around. When people come here, they, they go out and greet him. And, and that's what I was telling you about the one attack rooster. He pretended like he was your friend, but he was just kind of scoping you out <laughs> to see when he could get a, make an attack. If people want to look into or start raising chickens, what advice would you give to them? Study all aspects of it, like where are you going to put them, what kind are you going to have, how many are you going to have, what are you going to do with them once you've had them a few months. Uh, I got a daughter that's got chickens, I just talked to her this morning, that they're like four and five years old. Well, she's got the situation for that, um, but a lot of people wouldn't, especially like in the winter time. So you just look at, study all that and do some research and good time to do that is in the middle of winter and see what you want. But and, and then get it from a reliable source. And you'd look at hatcheries that have been in business for a long time, they're probably a better source than, say, going to a, a store and nobody knows anything about those chickens. I have a question. How do you care for ornamental grasses in the fall and spring? Well, in the fall, we love to see the showy flowers of ornamental grasses. They look really great. So in the fall, I wouldn't do anything to them. And actually in the winter, I'd enjoy their winter interest as well. But early spring is when you have to cut them back to the ground. So all this growth that you see is actually gonna die. So in the spring, you've got the dead tops there. So you wanna remove the dead tops on your grasses. I use uh, an electric hedge trimmer or my hands with hand pruners. And sometimes I tie them up and then cut off the top and then put them in my compost pile. But I do this uh, before growth starts in the spring. So usually during the month of April. But in the fall and the winter, leave your grasses up and just enjoy the tops because they're so beautiful. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. You said your daughter has had chickens or has had the same chickens. How long do they generally live? Well, some of them, some of those breeds can last up to 10 years or so, but that's unusual. The more hybridized they are, the higher bred they are to lay eggs and that type of thing, the less, the, the long, they don't live as long. So there's only so many eggs in a chicken from the time they're born or hatched. There's only so many pounds of milk in a dairy cow. Once they've reached that point, they're, they're done. They're kind of like us once we get a few years, yeah. <laughs> Some of our parts don't work as well right. as they used to. <laughs> yep, I understand that completely, <clears throat> especially as they get older. Are there regulations that people have to worry about too, especially if they're in town? Some mis municipalities don't allow any chickens. Alexandria is one of them, uh, but that's by vote of the city council or what the people want. Um, others will allow you to have a small number and not to have any roosters because I was talking to you earlier about waking people up in the morning. Now, I like to wake up to a rooster sound. I mean, that's, to me, it's like magic, but most people don't. So when you're in a, that goes back to consider your neighbors when you're thinking about this. Uh, they might be all the right thing for you, but it kind of needs to be good for your neighbors and be considerate of all that. So some cities have regulation. Minneapolis, interestingly enough, the last thing I heard, allows to have chickens, yeah. So it isn't necessarily any reason why one does one does. It depends on the politics of the of the town. So always find out your local regulations, no matter where you. Yeah, live. just call city hall, okay, or your township clerk, you know, and find out. Generally speaking, in rural areas, it's not a problem because in this in this area, you have to have five acres, so that usually separates you enough if you build a house in the country. But the, that's a good place where you can have dogs and cats and chickens and you know and you don't involve other people so much. Now you have the chickens for your vineyard. What have you noticed that they have eaten so that helps your grapes? 
That's a really hard question. I don't know. Um, but we know that they eat a lot of bugs. You watch them. You know, that's what they do all day long. One thing we've noticed in our whole area, we used to let them roam more. We'd have this outside, and once you set a pattern, uh, but then when we had picnic people here, they would want to jump on the tables and help themselves, which is not a good deal when you're thinking about being considerate of others, especially when they're paying for their meal and the chicken helps them eat it. It's um, the other thing that uh, we noticed here we used to have a lot of wood ticks, but we've been told, and I really believe this, that chickens will search out wood tick nests, you know, where the wood ticks are breeding and clean them out. And so we have had virtually no wood ticks ever since we've had chickens here. Really? And before that, we had tons of them. You could walk out and you'd get wood ticks. So now they haven't been roaming as much now, so I suppose eventually we'll have to let them go roaming again. But in the fall especially, and you know, they'll be out scratching in the woods all day long. And so that's all they do. And they have excellent eyesight. You know, they can see, I was telling you about a fruit fly, which is pretty small, but they can pick them right out of the air. So it's one of God's creations. That's just, it's a wonder if you really study them. It's, it's a wonderful little bird. You had mentioned that they scratch uh, in the ground. I know they scratch for food, but then do they also scratch for enjoyment or? I was always going to ask a chicken why they're doing that, but <laughs> <laughs> they're, it, it seems like they do it in the daytime in the hot weather. I don't know if they think they're cool or if they think they have some lice or something coming on that they're trying. I really don't know, but it's a natural habit that they seem to have. And if you have flower beds around, they seem to think that that's their best place. They'll dig out flowers and make a nest in the soft dirt. But they'll go down in their garden and they'll, they'll do it in the rows here where there is no, no, no plants, you know. And you'll see some if you walk around here that they, in the middle of the day, usually in the warmer the weather, the more they're doing it. It might be to keep cool, but yeah, they don't never told me why. I don't okay. know. <laughs> and you call those dust dusting bowls, or what do you call that? Dust baths as well. Dust baths. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for letting us come out and telling us and teaching us about raising chickens. This has been so fun. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering a CIRA. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm, shalomhill.org. Diamond Willow Advanced Care Assisted Living providing custom homes with smaller settings designed especially for high care needs. Mm -hmm.